Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to kick off the mineral physics portion of the CIDR program. So I wanted to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. And please feel free to interrupt as I go forward. And also, all of these slides will be available. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge a PhD student that's working with me, Natalia Solomatova, who uh, was heavily engaged in uh, the creation of this presentation. And uh, right now, she's at Goldschmidt. So she is presenting her work with uh, myself and Paul Asimov there. And uh, you'll see Goldschmidt come up a little bit later here in the talk. Uh, so what I'm really excited about is the, uh, well, many things, but the individuality of all of these phases and minerals, basically, that make up our planet. So each phase inside of the Earth has its own personality. And this is dictated by essentially the, the atoms and the arrangements that make up the phase, and also dictated by thermodynamics, right? So in terms of an equilibrium assemblage, you know, one goes towards uh, the lowest energy. Um, and what I show here are just a few snapshots of some of the major players, either in dynamics or in sort of interpretation of Earth's history. That includes a mineral inclusion that has a significant hydration component to it in diamond. Uh, Bridgmanite, which is a major silicate in Earth's uh, lower mantle, that only just received its name last year when it was found in a meteorite uh, and described by Oliver Chowner and his colleagues. And San Carlos Olivine, which is a lower pressure assemblage, uh, what we think makes up or at least describes a primitive upper mantle of the Earth that, contain, that contains uh, olivine and depending on the pressure can include uh, garnet and pyroxenes. And uh, what I also show here is the cleft segment of the Juan de Fuca Ridge, which is an active spreading area, and so which demonstrates that, uh, at least one example, that the Earth is extremely dynamic, active, and melting, and that these processes could be occurring throughout the entire Earth's interior, and that those processes are dictated by the individual components in their assemblages uh, that are uh, stable at uh, deeper depths. So a brief outline of the talk is, or uh, the tutorial is really um, just, to do a, just to do a basic overview of compositional constraints. Uh, these will be covered uh, in more depth in the geochemistry tutorials. And building minerals and coordination environments, essentially what are the common coordination environments, Again, these are the building blocks of the planet. And individually, they have their own distinct properties that can then essentially dictate the entire uh, behavior of the planet, which includes flow. And substitution mechanisms, so these are, oh, okay, you can use that, or the bamboo stick. And so some substitution mechanisms, which is uh, you know, a common uh, phenomena in uh, lower pressure mineral phases, and two component phase diagrams, including partial melting. So essentially, this is to get everyone uh, on the same page and even keel of major mineral phases, their coordination environments, and their uh, phase diagrams. Okay, so a basic uh, compositional constraints do come from uh, observations of our sun. So in terms of the terrestrial planets, uh, we have some constraints because we can observe the compositional spectrum of the sun. Now the details, so again, I'm not going to go into all of the details of the individual elements and what constrains each proportion because those are still a subject of great discussion in the community. And we saw earlier uh, in Matt Jackson's talk uh, about the 
uh, coal is super deep, so essentially the deepest drill hole is only about 12.262 kilometers. Actually, they, they've, there's a uh, slightly deeper hole, but this is you know, more horizontal, so it's a little bit <laughs> cheating. So this is a, one of the deepest vertical depths, and you know, compared to 6,000 and change kilometers of the radius of the Earth, this is really just a pinprick. And so how do we then gain a foundation and essentially, uh, you know, an understanding of what could possibly be uh, stable at deeper parts of the planet, which again, control the dynamics, can control the dynamics, their behaviors. And so going uh, deeper, one can look at Mantle Xenolith, San Carlos Olivine, for example. These are snapshots of primitive parts of the mantle uh, before they've been partially melted. So we'll get into that in, in a little bit. And some uh, primitive meteorites as well as palisites, which have been differentiated, the core mantle boundaries of smaller planetary bodies. And going deeper in terms of, uh, in terms of remote techniques, of course, seismology probes the mantle at very high spatial resolutions. Of course, depending on the region of the, of the interior of the planet, it can be extremely high spatial resolutions. And uh, experimental methods, such as large volume apparatus, a piston cylinder, or multi-anvil press. Then going smaller into um, the diamond anvil cell regime, which can access multi-megabar pressures, thus trying to tap into the phase equilibria uh, deep in the mantle, the base of the mantle, and the core, at least in terms of the Earth. And, and uh, the theory and experiments that complement and also guide some of the experiments that are done. So in terms of uh, element distributions, I've simply just uh, highlighted some of the major uh, elements and fractionated it to the weight um, in the crust and the weight um, sort of whole Earth approximation. Of course, these are approximations because, again, as we uh, were discussing this morning, it's not, you know, it's not completely settled whether the Earth is chondritic, for example. And so that can dictate the relative abundancies of things like uh, the magnesium content, the magnesium silicon ratio for example, which depending on that ratio that could essentially make, it could produce a more viscous lower mantle, just for example. Uh, and so that will, uh, so in terms of understanding that part, I, the details of the uh, individual elements that will also, you know, again, be discussed more in more detail in uh, the geochemistry talks. I put a few of the oxidation states of iron that are uh, commonly observed. There is a recent suggestion that it could exist as 4 plus. Uh, that is controversial, of course, that that is uh, something of, uh, you know, current interest in how the oxidation state of iron varies with depth and, uh, and hydration, the presence of hydration. And of course, where these elements reside then dictates the behavior of the materials. And so I'll go into some examples. There, just for example, yeah. What's an oh. example of a mineral that would have iron more than three plus? There's a suggestion that uh, iron hydroxide, uh, when subducted down to core mantle boundary conditions, can disassociate and essentially free up the hydrogen atoms, leaving FeO2 as one of the products, which would... And right, yes. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the crust, we have a, a very common, well, commonly thought assemblage of minerals, mostly dominated by the feldspars, the more than 50% of the crust and including you know, the nesosilicates, which are garnets and, um, and olivine structures, pyroxenes, quartz, micas, amphiboles. 
And uh, we'll go through a few of these uh, examples just to show what those minerals in terms of their internal structure look like. And I want to emphasize that the, you know, the, it's in terms of crystalline, in terms of the solid materials, uh, the crystalline materials, of course, have a lower free energy than their amorphous or, let's say, glassy counterparts. And it's a competition between the attractive, the binding forces, and the repulsive forces. And so these are dictated by the, essentially the, the forces between the atoms, the charges. And we'll go through some of those uh, examples in just a minute. And this can be determined experimentally, typically using X-ray diffraction, or neutron diffraction. It's mostly for the bulk material. Surface type probes include transmission electron microscopy, atomic force microscopy, electronic backscattering diffraction. But there really is no perfect crystal that exists. I think the closest thing come, the closest thing is silicon. So you may have seen, well, sometimes one can see these huge chunks of silicon that can make them essentially boulder sized quantities with less than, far less than a percent of vacancies. And that's essentially why they can be used as optical devices, They're essentially used to monochromate uh, X-rays, just for example, but there's no per really no perfect crystal exists, and this this is also an, an exciting area because there's, I mean, at any point in time, the the the, the structure of the the material is just a snapshot of those atomic positions. Really, these atoms have a certain you know neighborhood that they occupy. They you know so they have vibrational properties. Those define part of the stability, the vibrational thermodynamics. And many of these phases, especially at low pressure in the crustal areas, have defects. They're simply crystallize, they simply crystallize out, and in that particular environment, they have, um, they have voids in their crystal structure. And how those defects change with uh, compression is also a you know, a uh, focus of, sort of interdisciplinary research because it guides essentially how materials can flow. And we'll also see more details about, uh, we'll have more discussion about rheology uh, next week. And, um, and later this week, there'll be uh, more focused talks on elasticity and equations of state. And so in this presentation, I'm going to go through some of these common bonding environments. Uh, these are, uh, you know, in terms of crustal materials, we have the linear arrangement, triangular arrangement, tetrahedral, octahedral, cubic. Some examples, of course, is a common uh, carbonate phase, the calcite, which is uh, characterized by this triangular arrangement. And then you can imagine that uh, as we go into uh, large, larger coordinations, that we also have a very different uh, environment. So in the quartz system, it's essentially described as an interconnected network. And why this is a is this is stable or not stable, uh, that is touched upon in um, some of the uh, rules that will that we'll go into, Pauline's rules, for example. And in, uh, in periclase or in uh, olivine or pyroxene, the, magnesium, the common coordination number of magnesium is an octahedral environment. Now, as soon as a transition metal goes into that octahedral environment, it will distort it. And it will distort it in, it's described as the Jan-Teller distortion. Now that distortion, we'll see, has a large effect on physical properties of materials. And that's expressed in spin crossovers, where the iron atoms will change from a high spin state to a low spin state. Now that's, we'll give an example of that a little bit later. But in, yes? Just inboard and outboard. 
uh, in, as a three-dimensional oh, object. In yeah, yeah, in and out. <laughs> right, yeah, in and out. So we have something like this in three dimensions. And as soon as a transition metal ion comes in there, a cation comes in there, the unfilled D electrons favor a elongated section of this octahedron, which makes a Jan Teller distortion that essentially deviates from a cubic symmetry. And so it's essentially not perfect cubic symmetry, which can lead to some very um, interesting behaviors as that coordinate, as that symmetry changes. And that's what we'll see in a few minutes. So in these systems, uh, we have a common classification for uh, tetrahedral coordinations. And in isolated tetrahedrons, common in olivine and garnets, now, they, if they tend to sh uh, share corners, they can go into double tetrahedra chains or double chains. And an, essentially an infinite network and a sheet structure. So what we'll see is sort of an interesting uh, arrangement of these tetrahedra as we, as we compress the common phases. For example, in olivine, we start out with an isolated tetrahedral network. And at higher compressions, that those tetrahedra tend to, um, well, what we'll see is that they'll go into share corners and an infinite network in the Bridgmanite structure. And so having these uh, specific arrangements of atoms can see already that it will lead to, it could lead to anisotropic behavior. And so the forces that are acting on these um, atoms, which are expressed as bonds, you can imagine in a chain structure that uh, these, this could result in, say, higher forces along the chain and perhaps weaker forces perpendicular to the chain. And this is also, you see this in the sheet silicates where within the chain, it's a very strong material, like graphite, for example. Post uh, Bridgmanite is also another example of this sheet like silicate. And perpendicular to this sheet are extremely weak bonds, relatively speaking. In post Bridgmanite, they are still quite strong, though. The, in the post Bridgmanite structure, even though it's characterized as a sheet structure, it the, the bonding environments are still quite, um, well, they're anisotropic, but they're not as anisotropic as, let's say, graphite or a mica. It's a highly compressed and dense form of, of a sheet silicate. Oh, yeah. Should, should it not still be called post perovskite if you refer to the structure as a? Yeah, yeah. You can call it post. Yeah, I'm just curious about this. Like. Are we supposed to call it post Bridgmanite or post Prost? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. I think post. Well, because it doesn't have uh, a natural uh, observed counterpart, then it can. It should still have the name post perovskite. That causes some. But the calcium silicate phase, just as an aside, which we'll get to. <laughs> does not have a natural analog, so that's still referred to as calcium perovskite. But I think that for Bridgmanite, there's, I mean, there's some discussion whether you can call it post-Bridgmanite or post-perovskite. It's like the calcium chloride, it's like the stichovite phase. But, yeah, but <laughs> yes. Uh, family that has many, many, many compounds in it, it actually is more, I think, more accurate to portray it as post-Bridgmanite because that actually specifies it's the magnesium iron silicate. Just my opinion. It does, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, would, there could uh, be potentially many post-perovskites, like potassium tantalate has a totally different structure, but never mind. <laughs> exactly. But there, so there's, it does refer to the magnesium silicate phase. Uh, there are still a lot of discussions about what it, what that symmetry is for post-Bridgmanite or post-Provskite. Uh, 
<laughs> uh, well, we can refer to it, so I don't have a very strong opinion on this particular topic, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the international mineralogical um, community does, and they, um, they would stubbornly still call that post perovskite because there is no natural <laughs> But you should be on their panel. <laughs> It's a structural, it's a, it's a structural it's a transition. It's a structure. It's a designation of something that is after uh, the MTFDSIO3 phase. But it, no, because you also have it with different composition. So you have some iridate. Iridate, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it can also be, <laughs> it can also be before, if can, you think of the Can we move on? Because... <laughs> Yeah. I don't, I, excuse uh, me, power. excuse me. I, I don't want people to get the wrong impression and think that this is one of the most exciting areas right now in mineral <laughs> physics, discussing the name of our potential lowermost mantle. Nor is it pedagogically important. Right. Call it what you want. Thank you. All right. So moving on, uh, we'll, <laughs> we will uh, just briefly go through uh, these symmetry environments. So this is a very a common t set of terminology that mineral physicists use to describe materials and their different phases. Um, and so although there are 14 <laughs> different Bravais lattices, uh, the, I will just focus on a few of the very symmetric ones, cubic and hexagonal. From those systems, you can distort it distort the structure in ways that are, of course, important for understanding their physical properties. But in terms of our discussion, I'll just give examples of the cubic and hexagonal systems. In the posted notes, I'll show, I'll provide all of them. Uh, so in the cubic system, there are three different ways of uh, classifying the cube, a cubic system. It's so a primitive simple cubic, which is quite rare, actually, a body-centered cubic and a face-centered cubic. This is where the atoms reside, as you can imagine, on the faces of the cubes. And if we look at them in three dimensions, uh, we have the simple cubic, again, body-centered cubic, which is a common structure for a low-pressure uh, phase of iron and the uh, face-centered cubic. The FCC is a high temperature phase of iron. In the primitive cubic system, it is quite rare because the packing efficiency is not, uh, it's not very efficient. And so one example is polonium metal. Uh, this is more for just demonstration purposes. It's not a common structure in uh, minerals or alloys. In um, a simple cubic system, when you have more than one element, uh, we do have, you know, these sort of interpenetrating cubes, and one example is the cesium chloride. And in body-centered uh, cubic, uh, the, you know, the common mineral that we think of on the Earth's surface is uh, metallic iron. It's uh, BCC. Okay, so this is also quite interesting because it is, it is cubic, but we also know that it is magnetic, right? And so having a specific, having a magnetism, and actually it has a pretty significant magnetic field at the iron site, means that it is not exactly cubic. Locally, there is some distortion which gives rise to a magnetic field. And for face-centered cubic, uh, of course, rock salt, halite, table salt is a primo example of uh, this structure. But also iron at high temperatures will adopt the FCC structure at relatively low pressures. Yes. Uh, if you go back one slide. Um, you said because it has a magnetic, a strong magnetic field at the body center, at the center of the cube, we know that it is not perfectly cubic. 
Can you help me through that reasoning? Yeah, at each iron site, exactly. Um, not to be confused with just the center. Okay. Uh, so at each iron site, uh, there is a, about a, um, a few tens of Tesla, if one you know, measures it with, let's say, Mossbauer spectroscopy of a field that has a particular angle with its crystal structure. So the, the magnetic structure, which is defined uh, by the, the field strength and its orientation with the other pl these vertical planes and uh, you know, cube diagonal planes, is actually a slightly different uh, symmetry environment. And so what that so in, in this case, for BCC iron, we see that if the uh, if this were in a magnetic field, that we would be able to uh, measure a distinct what's called a, um, the, the the magnetic phase angle, and that that angle is slightly different than uh, these 90 degree angles that define the cube. So there's a magnetic structure that's um, that's uh, essentially um, embedded in the so-called static structure. This is also the case for magnetite, for example. It has a very clear static structure of the atoms, but within the iron sublattice, it defines a different symmetry, which allows for a relatively weak field, but it is observable. I mean, that's, yeah. OK, thank you. Sure. I guess maybe Ved's question was something to the effect that there's symmetry in that crystal structure. Mm -hmm. And so why doesn't the effect of each atom on the other, the mag two magnetic torques or whatever, balance? And so there's no net distortion. Because right? we look at that picture and there's symmetry everywhere. Right. you'd expect the magnetic influences to be, to retain that symmetry. Right. So, so it's in re a reversible interaction, right? Yes, yes. Yes, so in, uh, in a random orientation of iron atoms, or in, in, in with BCC iron, we see that the field is relatively uniform. And so if, you know, if one sort of, um, yeah, again, if one uh, aligns it either with a preferred stress or a, a, a non-hydrostatic stress tensor, uh, then one starts to see these alignments and a slight deviation from cubic symmetry. Otherwise, for all intents and purposes, it can, it does average out, but in any particular direction, it can be very strong. So it's like elastic anisotropy. So in cubic phases, we can see that there is a strong preference for uh, you know, stiff directions in the bonds versus weaker directions in the bonds. So this, this the magnetic field is a, is a tensor, and so it will, it d does not need to be um, uniform. Yeah, maybe you should just add, this is only for low temperature, up to the Curie point. Above it, it is uh, perfectly cubic. R right, it is perfectly cubic above the Curie temperature. So in that case, you know, magnetic, you have magnetic relaxations. And for different minerals, you have different Curie temperatures. Um, so this is, yeah, this is um, another subject of great interest. So moving, moving forward, uh, we can go quickly through uh, this is the face-centered cubic. This is a common structure for a higher temperature iron. This is, this is the example where there is no magnetic field, as Rudy just uh, pointed out. So, but the uh, interesting thing about, so that I give the example of sphalerite here to show uh, this nice um, hand sample. Uh, but in terms of FCC iron, the phase, the crystal structure transition is measurably several tens of Kelvin different than the magnetic phase transition. And so there is a, you know, there's this magnetic term that is, you know, needs to be added to the uh, free energy. And that term is sort of lingering on as the material is, is raised to higher temperatures. Uh, 
Okay, so moving through the uh, sort of the the cubic system, the the example that is commonly used in deep earth mineral physics discussion is the periclase structure, the periclase wustite solid solution. And so in the earth, uh, the uh, phase equilibria studies have put the ferropericlase composition at a, anywhere between about 10 to 30 percent, depending on what is coexisting, what other phase is coexisting with that phase. And there are suggestions that this can be a significant component either at the uh, base of the mantle or in the core, very iron-rich concentrations. So, but this is the starting symmetry, essentially B1, it's also a, a, a terminology used in our community, but it's essentially the rock salt structure and we have a face-centered cubic arrangement. And the other example I wanted to show is the hexagonal system. So the hexagonal system nicely describes our, you know, the A common phase that we observe uh, at the surface of the earth, quartz, and down to um, some minor um, compressions and temperatures as a, you know, network structure. But it also describes the most abundant phase in the core. So iron and What's thought for most of the iron-rich alloys is that it's thought to crystallize in the HCP phase. And the HCP phase is a very specific stacking arrangement of the iron atoms. We can think of these, um, I'll go through this in just a minute, uh, as, you know, as essentially the mo one of the most efficient ways to pack a structure. An FCC arrangement, which we were just looking at, uh, can, you know, one has a, a third type of stacking arrangement, which, you know, in terms of large compressions, it's not as favorable because the more, you know, degree, at least at high compressions, because this leads to more degrees of freedom. Now, this, this is why this is then, that's why this is, favored at high temperatures because you do have more degrees of freedom here. And so going through, there's a few examples of uh, some of the, you know, el the elemental uh, uh, metals, beryllium, magnesium, zinc, they commonly um, crystallize in this hexagonal close packing as well as cobalt. So sometimes they're used as analogs to the, the main phase in the core because at least up to now it's it has not it's it's not possible to crystallize the HCP phase of iron at room pressure and temperature conditions. So a few uh, schematics of these different packing arrangements, the HCP and the the FCC phase, and uh, going further we can see that the, um, in, in the HCP structure that we have, again, because, the, because we're going A, B, A, A, um, B, A, that, that leads to a more efficient arrangement of the atoms. There are less interstitial sites. And so what do I mean by interstitial sites? We can see that in the AC environment, there's an octahedral hole. So this is where elements could reside in those holes. But you can imagine that at larger and larger compressions that that becomes unfavorable. But something that is... D yeah. So these two uh, packing, we have identical packing efficiencies mathematically, right? Yes. Yes, but... Oh, okay. Yeah, so the question or the comment is that, yes, the FCC and the HCP uh, structural arrangements and the layering, they have the same uh, packing efficiency mathematically. But if one looks at the free energies associated with those arrangements, we also consider entropy. And when we have in this uh, arrangement here, in the hexagonal close pass 
PAC system, we have a more favorable arrangement uh, for the iron atoms than in the FCC uh, phase in this different stacking arrangement. But yes, it's, if mathematically they have the same packing efficiency, but they have different entropies. Okay, so when, when do different elements form solid solutions with other elements in mineral systems? I mean, there are some guidelines for this process. It's not really a free-for-all. <laughs> and Pauline outlined this um, in great detail. And I think it's still, well, it's uh, fairly well uh, reproduced and uh, I would like to just show four of them. There's actually a fifth one, parsimony. Uh, in the radius ratio argument is that uh, the, the cations are generally smaller than the adions, so you know, we begin with this radius ratio of one. Okay, but only cations that are large enough to not rattle around in the interstitials, and, but small enough to fit in. So it really does need to be a sweet spot of the size. Can't rattle too much. And so we have these uh, schematic representations and then a more uh, quantitative table later on. And we have an unstable limit where you see this cation would just be rattling in its cage. And now this could be stabilized in a very, very tiny space of pressure and temperature, such as you can imagine, uh, well, zeolite structures, which are very open networks, they tend to absorb some of these cations, like cesium, that's a common void occupier. And in going through, uh, you know, some of the different examples, uh, we can see that based on some of these environments that we discussed earlier, one can use these uh, radius ratios as guidelines to whether a certain element will uh, exchange with another element or form a bond. And so I've just given uh, a list of these elements. I won't go through, I'll leave those just for reference. And we'll go through with the, um, the electrostatic vacancy a valency principle, and uh, this has to do with the, you know, the bond strength it, uh, being proportional to the cation charge and the coordination number. And uh, going through the uh, interconnectivity, the, um, the sharing of the polyhedral corners and edges, this is something that, you know, folks have seen uh, a lot of examples in, in a basic mineralogy class and that as one starts to uh, share more surfaces, it does become unfavorable because we're losing degrees of freedom. We have an isolated, one can imagine the isolated tetrahedra over here, which is characteristic of olivines and garnets, going to corner sharing. And edge sharing is really not favorable. And so you will, it, it is extremely unlikely to find this. One might be able to push a structure into the state, perhaps kinetically, uh, but thermodynamically, it's really an unfavored arrangement, as, and especially the, the face sharing arrangement. Okay, and uh, the crystals containing different cations. This is this is one of the most prevalent topics uh, in in terms of. Uh, discussing different uh, phases that uh, comprise the rocks that we observe at various depths in the earth is that of course it's not a, these are not pure end-member phases that we observe in the earth. It is not favorable to form pure magnesium end-member olivine. It's not favorable to form pure FeO. There is going to be some mixing. And in terms of the guidelines or what are the sort of the traffic rules for this, they are they do still need to be relatively similar in size and relatively similar in charge. And a few examples uh, I give are the potassium, sodium, calcium substitutions. This is very common in the feldspars. Uh, the manganese, iron, uh, magnesium, and iron 3 plus, 
this is these are very are you know very common in the refractory phases like olivine, pyroxenes, uh, the MGO FEO solid solution, and and even um, the substitution of iron three plus and aluminum three plus is is common and it's uh, thought to be the dominant substitution uh, in the lower mantle when we have bridgmanite in the presence of garnet, which is the aluminum, which is delivering the aluminum to the system. And something to also consider is that the effect of charge on, on anion size. So I'll give the example of sulfur. See, from 2 minus to 6 plus is a significant change in the size. So this will dictate, this helps to dictate uh, where this, uh, what the oxidation state of sulfur will be stabilized in which particular arrangement. And the same is, uh, so we can think of, uh, that's with, we can think of the effect of pressure uh, for silicon. Of course, at low pressures, we have tetrahedral coordination moving towards octahedral coordination in the transition zone and lower mantle. And uh, the garnet phases do contain the cubic coordination of silicon. Okay. And going uh, quickly through Goldschmidt's rules, this is uh, and going um, going on right now, the Goldschmidt conference in Japan is uh, is this notion that Goldschmidt uh, presented of the similar size and uh, essentially the ionic um, behavior. And so I'll go quickly through this. Uh, in that the iron two plus iron three plus is common, so we can think of this in terms of Pauline's rules of the size and. You uh, can also think of what, what are the cases that are not likely, the sodium and aluminum 3 plus, which are extremely unlikely. Jennifer, I have a, I have a question. I guess it's about combined Pauling's rules and Goldschmidt rules. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the kind of rules that predict, you know, the types of minerals that we see and the diversity that we see are based on you know, very large differences in ion sizes. Um, mm -hmm. And so... I guess my question is, is as you go to really high pressures, like in the deep mantle, um, do the, you know, do the, do the ions share that same very large size distribution, or are they closer together in size? And if so, does that, does that mean that the rules for deep earth structures are maybe a little different from Pauling's rules, or maybe some of the rules become more important or less important? And does it mean that maybe there's less of a diversity in the deep earth compared to the surface? Yeah, I think it's the latter, that they're, because of compression, the sizes do become similar. So the rules can still be applied. And so that leads us to, uh, you know, to understand some of these systems that have been calculated or observed experimentally, that there can be more exchange of elements, of different types of elements that we wouldn't normally think of at, you know, in the upper mantle or crustal conditions. So sodium and calcium, which are normally not as favorable to, let's say, to enter the Bridgmanite phase, there's, could become favorable. Uh, it depends on also what's coexisting with that phase. Right? I, uh, the calcium silicate perovskite structure does have a larger cation uh, area to perhaps accommodate some sodium if there's uh, some basaltic or sediment, sediment components that are being subducted into the mantle. So I think we, sh we, should, we should not be limited by the behavior of minerals at the, you know, at, at the surface of the earth, but that those rules can, are still applicable because they they do. F yeah. so what she's saying that under higher pressure, the cation size will become similar. Yes. Well, so if we look at the size of the silicon, it's just just as an example. This is a schematic. Uh, the uh, this relative size will then be similar to the aluminum for, and iron and perhaps magnesium and, and calcium. Now what would need to be done is just to compare this with single crystal x-ray diffraction measurements, which do, which do sort of put constraints on these sizes. 
that's how we how one constrains the size distributions. Yes. Uh, yes, but all these rules actually works when we consider a model of atom, which is a hard sphere. Uh, we only yeah. consider a hard sphere yeah. model for atom. Uh, in a crystal, the electron density mm -hmm. is uh, more diverse than just a sphere around the yes. atom. So oh, for sure. That's yeah. why we, we have uh, several cases in which we can't apply these rules. Yeah. Right. especially for the liquids, <laughs> but uh, yeah, for solids, it's sometimes it's much more complicated. Yeah, that's true. So these are, yeah, it's been, these are basic guidelines that can also put some, put some constraints on how we try to put together the planet, because it's, again, it's really not, um, there, there are some, considerations that we that that hold at any compression if there are similar sizes they could be uh, favorable to e exchange with each other so that's really something to still consider and also at higher temperatures there is the uh, contribution from entropy allows for more of this mixing general it's you know getting above 6000 kelvin there is significant probability that many of the elements will say alloy into iron for example this is a argument uh, that is used for the um, the case of the magnesium dissolution into the core it's not really magnesium per se it's a, it's a small amount of essentially as something that is is not that abundant so magnesium was chosen one could make the argument and the results wouldn't change that much for say calcium or aluminum okay so in the coupled so we've gone through the coupled substitution so I will um, go through this uh, relatively fast uh, for uh, the calcium and aluminum, these are favorable uh, in terms of exchanging with each other uh, with sodium. It's similar to sodium and silicon. The albite anorthite uh, solid solution that I'd like to go through uh, to show uh, some examples of, uh, of, of that solid solution and of melting. And so coupled substitution is also uh, the a nice example of corundum and ilmenite that these uh, two end members can uh, easily form a solid solution uh, using the um, substitution of iron and titanium for aluminum. And with uh, the the iron sulfide system, we we'll also see that uh, that is that there is. A, uh, situ there are situations where the sulfur does become more oxidized and in that case in this particular structure vacancies are formed in order to balance the charge so I have a few examples of that and with the interstitial sites uh, you can imagine this is a common zeolite like structure where it has very large empty cages um, but the ch and the charge balance uh, can be maintained by by putting uh, a small amount of uh, of cations that are essentially just balancing the charge but are of similar size that can fit in there but they don't rattle around too much and so this can also facilitate ion exchange where the network remains intact but the elements that are residing in the cages could be easily exchanged this is uh, common in some of these um, heavy elements, strontium, cesium, and it's used for nuclear waste remediation, for example, or at least in the thought that it could absorb some of those nasty cations by sticking them into a zeolite. Jennifer, can you remind us what you mean when you say oxidized? Does that mean that the charge goes up? <laughs> when you said sulfur gets more oxidized. Yeah, so uh, it has to... Um, be balanced with a either um, 
well, in the neighborhood of when it becomes oxidized, it loses an electron, so that electron has to go somewhere. So either it goes into another uh, phase that, like iron metal, for example, in the case of iron being oxidized, or it could be that the partial pressure of oxygen in the whole assemblage changes. And so that that's another aspect that's um, not touched upon in this talk, but perhaps in uh, some geo in the geochemistry discussions is that that environment, the oxygen environment, this is discussed as a, um, well, in terms of Earth's history, or of course, is a major change in the oxygen content of the atmosphere and how that is um, expressed in the deeper parts of the planet and is there any evidence that we have for that change or a smoking gun, I should say. Okay, so the next series of, of slides, I wanted to just briefly go through a two-component phase diagram. This is, uh, you know, a similar, uh, this can be applied to uh, all solid solutions that are two-component end members. And, you know, many, some of you probably have seen this before, and uh, this case is just really to bring everyone up to speed on uh, what is meant when we're going through these processes because the Earth did not just crystallize out of a melt and it's a single composition. There's a whole process of melting and remelting and what does that mean when the, the residual phase is different than the starting liquid. And so in a two-component system like the albite anorthite system, you know, in a phase diagram, this is just a two-component system. Now, these are really, uh, can be expressed in n dimensions. So I want to really just do a two-component system here to simplify it. And so we have, so we have the all-solid region, the all-liquid region, and of course the region in between is a liquid and crystal. And the melting point of the sodium end member, which is the, the lower, uh, it's not as refractory as the anorthite, has a lower melting point than uh, the end member anorthite, the calcium end member. And in going through uh, this, you know, in between the two, of course, is the, is the loop that defines the coexistence of the solid and the liquid. And so any composition in between this will not have a single melting point. And so we have the liquidus that defines the line that separates the liquid and the liquid plus solid. Okay, so if we start with a composition that has is 30% anorthite and we lower the temperature as we go into this loop, we now start to uh, encounter two different types of chemistries that are defined by the lever rule, which I show in the next slide. And so this composition here, if we were to look at that, take a snapshot of it, let's say experimentally, just quench that, we would find that we would have crystals that are 55% anorthite and 15% uh, albite. Now, what are the proportions? Those are determined by the lever rule. The melt fraction be defined by uh, this area here, this line, it's a line, uh, relative to the total line. And so this is a, this, we'll also see that this process here, if this continues and nothing disturbs the system, we have the equilibrium melting or equilibrium crystallization. And so there are essentially two types of you know, generalize them into equilibrium melting and fractional crystallization. This isn't necessarily just happening near the surface of the planet to create mid-oceanic ridge basalt. It could be happening at, at all depths, depending on where the geotherm intersects the solidus of the whole system. And so in, in doing the equilibrium, equilibrium crystallization, one can uh, use the same uh, terminology is just crystallizing instead of melting. And for the equilibrium crystallization, we start with, let's say, a 70% anorthite, 
and we're not disturbing the system. So we go through the, um, the process of observing melts and crystals. So this, this can be applied to any system. Right? Of course, in n dimensions, it becomes a lot more complicated. But the math is there. There's, there's, you know, there's something. Um, I mean, there are, of course, experimental constraints that uh, that do make this difficult to determine all of those terms in the n component system. But it is, it's, it's a tractable problem. And so, in any system, when you have some melt sand, we, we talk about systems in the Earth, uh, LLSVPs, ultra-low velocity zones, subducted slabs, sediments. There's discussion about whether or not they create or they, uh, they permit partial melting to happen. That means the chemistry is going to change if it is not an equilibrium process. And so in an equilibrium process, we just march through and the proportions at any snapshot in time in the binary loop are again dictated by the lever rule, but if it's not disturbed, it just crystallizes out at the same composition. But the Earth is dynamic, and it's very likely that some of this melt will be uh, extracted, and that crystals will separate out. And so when they separate out, they start trajectory, they start, if the crystals then start to sink, which we see clear examples of this, even in the scare guard inclusion that Quentin showed earlier, and the Palisades Hill, is beautiful examples of this, is that the crystals sink. So they're separated out from this whole system. And when they sink, they then define a different composition of the melt. And this composition evolves through the loop as the different compositions of the crystals sink because they are denser. And we move down defined by the, essentially, the lever rule at each step, how much proportion and which uh, composition, what composition is the melt and what composition is the solid. And so in this particular example, the, the last crystallize, the last materials to crystallize are the very sodium rich, close to the sodium rich end member, albite. And that's observed in in some of these uh, systems, this is a very um, obviously this is a cartoon image, but one can you know imagine this situation, and it's not necessarily just happening at the surface of the Earth. And this defines a Bowen's reaction series, which is a common sort of way to think about how minerals crystallize out uh, at minerals that are. Uh, you know, under relatively low compressions. And so this continuous series was what I just showed an example of, the calcium-rich plagioclase, which is very refractive, uh, going down to the anorthite sodium uh, plagioclase. In the uh, system of olivine to biotite, this is a discontinuous series because this is not a simple two-phase system. There are, you, there are uh, interruptions of the phase uh, diagram as uh, eutectics and paratectics, and that will separate out a system in a, and not a, uh, it will not evolve through one continuous loop. It will jump around to the other loops. And so, in examples at the surface of the Earth, we have a very nice uh, field observation of the dense, highly refractive crystals sinking down to the base of this fill. I mean, this was a, um, there is some basalt at the bottom here because it, you know, cooled very quickly. But we see the heavy refractory element, I mean, heavy, the refractive uh, minerals down at the base and less refractory sodium-rich plagioclase up near the top. And having this example here, I want to invigorate some thought of how these processes are happening in deeper parts of the Earth, because it, it is quite likely that there is some intersection of the solidus with the geotherm. And that could give rise to a stratified layer that may, whether this is stable over geologic time is another uh, area of, disc of discussion. If it's stratified, how, 
long can that layer stay there? There is some suggestion that within LLSVPs that it is essentially stratified. Is that stable? Yes, Quentin. But it's even a little more complicated than that. <laughs> yes. <A little> <laughs> complicated because we actually don't have a good constraint across the mineral melt system there of whether they go up or down. Exactly. Exactly. So there's uh, some nice uh, shock measurements recently on the silicate on a silicate uh, solid solution with iron, calcium, and magnesium. These are results that uh, came out of uh, the shock lab at Caltech, um, part of Claire Waller's thesis that showed that it that within con chondritic light compositions that it was very difficult to form a melt that was dense enough to sink. But if you go to more exotic and extreme end member cases, there could be you know, iron, more iron rich melts that aren't really consistent with the, I mean, at least what folks think of some of the end member compositions. Uh, so there is a lot of discussion. Yeah. Well, and by exotic, you could mean basalt. <laughs> oh, that was, so that wasn't, uh, in that system, that was not sampled, so right, there was exactly. no discussion of that, so of course. So, so let's not get too, let's not, so it is a very limited compositional subset that that looks at. And so, for example, something like a morb would not actually fall in that compositional domain. Right. So I, I, I just am questioning the use of the term exotic. Exotic. <laughs> right. So, Jennifer, so, yes. so there are <coughs> conditions under which you would have melt at the uh, core mantle boundary perhaps within the LLSVPs, reasonable conditions in the present day? So there was a, there was a nice uh, talk last week at the Compress Annual Meeting by Alan McNamara, who showed some dynamic simulations that in those simulations in three dimensions show that this is, this is work in progress, that he showed that actually the hottest parts of the evolution of these large low shear velocities are not at the edges. They're more inboard. And so there's, I mean, in those cases, there's a, um, you know, these are relative values. So it's, they don't prescribe a specific temperature. But what they did look for were where the regions were hot and I mean, essentially the, the thermal gradient around, along the core mantle boundary. And so I think this, I mean, these are, uh, you know, the, this is not the only dynamic simulation of these uh, materials, but it was thought for a while that the hottest parts of these LLSVPs were at the edges. And at least from dynamic simulations, they, at least this particular simulation showed that they were more inboard. Jennifer, a question about the question you just posed to us and something you said earlier. So at higher pressures, you made the point that all atoms become more similar in terms of sizes. So does that mean that as you go to higher pressures, the difference between the liquidus and the solidus temperature gets smaller? And so the importance of fractional crystallization also becomes relatively less important? It could be, yes. I think there's just not enough... There really aren't enough studies. There are only a handful now that have been done in the diamond anvil cell at core mantle boundary pressures. And there, there really is a difficult, I mean, it's, there's a difficulty in defining the solidus and liquidus from those uh, experiments. Although they do make the claim that they are still relatively large. This is for morb and for a more peridotitic melt. So they make that claim. And uh, so I'm going to, this, we've already talked about decompression melting. Uh, this was something uh, raised by Michael Manga. And uh, the d in terms of generating melts, there are uh, <coughs> ways that we can think of it in terms of either just the normal situation where we don't have an intersection of the geotherm and the solidus, or where the geotherm is raised significantly to intersect with the solidus. This is such an event at the mid-oceanic ridge. In deeper parts, there could be a stronger gradient in temperature that allows for melt to be produced at depths. This is something that uh, we can consider at all depths of the Earth. 
and that this geotherm, or sorry, and this solidus again is defined by the system. And so if one has a system such as mid-oceanic ridge basalts and their sediments, their hydrosediments, this could be significantly lowered, as is shown just schematically here, uh, as the subduction proceeds and the devolatilization of the sediments here could lead to a intersection of that uh, geotherm and the melting or this, the solidus of this system. So, and from many of these experiments and computational work, the you know the lower mantle as an average rock could be considered as uh, peridotitic, although this is making a certain claim about the ratios of magnesium and silicon. So this is not, these boundaries are not set in stone. These are, this is based on experiments that are done on this particular system of olivine, garnet, and pyroxenes as found in uh, peridotites, like the San Carlos olivine nodule, I'll show you as, as an example. It is possible to generate or to have a system that has a little bit more olivine or a little bit less olivine. And that is a topic of discussion, especially for the transition zone, where the seismic gradients are significantly higher than they are in the upper mantle and the lower mantle. And then as we go down deeper, uh, we see the formation, the, the disassociation of ringwoodite into the oxide and the bridgmanite phase. And as this is going on in the transition zone, actually at shallower depths, the calcium silicate perovskite phase is exolving out of the garnet phase. And then we get down to a post perovskite phase in the D double prime layer. So showing a few examples of these phase diagrams, here I show the uh, phosphorite phalite solid solution phase diagram that starts at low pressure and goes up to just the shallow part of the lower mantle. This is a, this is a fairly well-studied system at, you know, at lower iron concentrations where we think the Earth's upper mantle falls around 10 to 12 percent iron. And that going through these loops, remember that these, if the, if the uh, the system is not disturbed, then it will have a finite width to that transition, which could help in interpreting seismic discontinuities. So we'll get to that example in just a second. But on the right, I show just the magnesium end member phase diagram, where we see the simplification of the olivine, wadsleyite, ringwoodite phase transitions. But we know in the mantle it's not pure phosphorite, it's not pure iron, pure iron free end member. And so we must think of these systems as having at least finite phase loops. And having finite phase loops, you know, for the olivine system, this was one of the, um, the very exciting parts of experimental mineral physics was the observation, the discovery of the densification of olivine and that that occurred at, approx at just about the conditions that the seismo seismologists were observing strong reflections around 400 or 410, which is shown here. And those are the vertical lines here, which is uh, based, this is a review article by Frost. And then as we get to higher compressions, see these are the Clapeyron slopes of these phase transitions, and this, these are all isolated tetrahedra. But when it goes into the bridgmanite, it becomes a network of tetrahedra, of, of octahedra, sorry. So it actually goes into a, 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 an arrangement that is, d d just doesn't, doesn't have as many degrees of freedom. And that could help one understand the change in slope. Now there's, it's, slightly negative. And there are some very nice experiments done by Dan Shim, that's this line right here, that showed that this was you know, indeed happening around the 660 kilometer discontinuity 
And so that's in a system that's for only think about olivine. Of course, the, the earth, I mean, that if it makes up at least 50% of the mantle, it's definitely a good, uh, ex, a very valid explanation for those seismic discontinuities. But in terms of mass transfer and how those discontinuities change in their width and their uh, location depend on the coexisting phases. So we know there is also uh, the gar a garnet system, or if we look at the pure MGSiO3 system, this is, n this is not in the presence of aluminum garnet. But it does, it does form a dense structure called majorite. And at low temperatures, it trajects along this Akimotoite phase. And it's possible that this is uh, present in subducted slabs. But now when we think about the whole system, it's simply not just olivine. Right? And what ha so these phase loops, they depend on, if, if one just takes them at face value, then one is asserting that there's no iron exchange in the system. In the presence of garnet, actually, what's been shown is that the iron, well, the, the ringwoodite tends to suck up a little bit of that. Not all of it there's some equilibrium between the two, right? But it sucks up a little bit of it, enough so that it could sharpen up the boundary, right? If it moves over to the right, we are going through this phase loop. Now it's talking to majorite, and majorite's saying, okay, fine, you can take some of my iron. And then ringwoodite is essentially now uh, finished with its phase loop at a shallower depth. And this could sharpen up the transition. This could be, I mean, there are, there are uh, several lines of discussion about this, but it could be a reason why the 520 is observed in some areas and not in others. Uh, could you re-elucidate uh, what do you mean by phase loop? This uh, region here. So this region here is analogous to that solid liquid loop I showed earlier. But this is an olivine and Wadsleyite loop. So instead of it being, instead of one thinking of it in terms of just the general phase diagram I showed earlier where it was solid and liquid, this is uh, Wadsleyite and olivine. And then likewise, this phase loop here is the coexistence of Wadsleyite and ringwoodite as it's compressed. And this is at uh, 1600 centigrade. Okay, okay. okay so uh, moving forward, I, I wanted to show this uh, nice uh, computational result uh, by uh, Lars Stixrud and Carolina lithgow Bertoloni. And what this shows is that from first principles, and there is some uh, benchmarking that they did at you know, lower pressure in terms of uh, uh, making, sort of uh, actually plotting the phase boundaries with uh, observed experiments. I shouldn't say benchmarking, they actually you know, derive, they make the claim that's derived from first principles, and that one can see that this, the trajectory, which is shown right here, this is a density um, line that's shown here, is that in the transition zone, that they're, you know, they are observing this uh, olivine to Wadsleyite transition in the presence of garnet, and they also have some uh, some clinopyroxene that is still stable here. Okay, now the effect of hydration. So I would like to use the word hydration because uh, in many of these structures, at least in Wadsleyite and Ringwoodite, uh, they're found as hydroxyl groups. So they're not actually individual water groups, which is different than some of the lower pressure sediments and phases where they have uh, molecular water. And as a, you know, just as a uh, general trend, this, this, is, this is, can be more complicated than this, especially in the presence of iron. 
that it has been suggested that it reduces the uh, transition pressure and adding another, adding another component to the system should necessarily either ex expand the phase loop, i.e. broaden it, or, um, or at least keep it the same. It's, it, it's unlikely to sharpen it because you're actually adding components to the system. So this uh, scenario, uh, one can uh, sh plot these, uh, the Clapeyron slopes of these phase boundaries and, and then actually assess them with respect to different geotherms. And so we see that in, the, in colder regions, which could be characterized more uh, accurately by a slab geotherm, that the transition is occurring at lower pressures as compared to ambient mantle, or however one wants to define ambient mantle. And so if these transitions, just for example, if these transitions are uh, happening at lower pressures, it means that, of course, and that would make a prediction that in subducted areas that one would observe the reflection at shallower depths compared to 400. Uh, these solid lines are just the olivine system. And, and then the dashed lines are the peridotite with uh, wet composition. Hydrate is showing that it could be, well, it's likely to be shallower depths uh, if you have a similar system. Obviously, it will be a little bit different because the hydration will alter the individual chemistries of the phases. But these solid lines are essentially olivine-dominated systems that are dry. So roughly 60% olivine. Okay, so moving forward into well, just uh, just to uh, show the silica system at low pressures. Uh, this is a, a common phase in anywhere from a few percent to perhaps up to 10% in volume of. Uh, mid-oceanic ridge basalts, and uh, so this, so one should one should uh, consider this phase, especially because it has extremely anisotropic properties. The stishovite, it's highly, it's very stiff, but it's also very uh, elastically anisotropic. And in the mid-oceanic ridge basalt system, we see okay, this is the loop, the solidus liquidus. And this is as a function of temperature. As we increase, so we see a similar, we see a phase assemblage that's similar, at least at low pressures. We'll have a pyroxene and garnet, and then that will transform into the denser phase major at clinopyroxene and coasite, and distichovite, because the silica phase is going through the phase, uh, its own phase equilibrium. So in in lower, like in when we think of this schematic representation, uh, we can we could summarize. Of course, it's it's always more complicated than this because not every single chemical uh, assemblage has been say measured in the laboratory. But one can make some basic general conclusions, and that with temperature, it decreases the transition pressure of olivine and wadsleyite. The presence of iron does affect the width of the transition. It's another component, so it will broaden the transition. And the transition pressure. So this typically decreases, but this is not necessarily observed for every single system in the deep earth. We can make this generality for the, for the olivine system and perhaps the lower pressure phase assemblages. And garnet, you know, change it, it affects the width of the transition. It actually sharpens it near the 520. And, you know, in terms, when we look at uh, the hydration component, that in, in many studies it's been shown to decrease the transition pressure. 
So I have, um, I think I will go through, this is a, a, just a one, one example of looking a little bit deeper and, and looking at the, uh, the iron oxide component and the spin crossover. And uh, in terms of discussing how the spin crossover can affect the uh, dynamics of the lower mantle. And I show this image here because it's been thought to explain some of these uh, isolated pockets of ultra low velocity zones that may not be associated with uh, hot spots. And so going back to the, the solid solution, we see at least at room pressure a complete solid solution of periclase and wustite. And the iron 2 plus in the octahedral, in octahedral coordination, as it is in, in any structure in octahedral coordination, has unpaired electrons. So this is what uh, we mean by a high spin state, is because it's dominated by the high spin uh, uh, direction of the electrons. And at low pressure, you'll see that the crystal field splitting energy is lower than the spin pairing energy. And so that means that it's unfavorable to pair those spins, to pair them up, to bring them down. But at higher compression or at shorter bond lengths, they will pair. And this has also been shown by DFT theories that that becomes more symmetric environment and also denser by a few percent. And so that has an effect on the total density of the system. So in a study that uh, Natalia did uh, using neon as a pressure medium, just show a result that is important for understanding uh, the dynamics and also compositional effects, that using uh, the same criteria to define the spin crossover, it is evident that with increasing iron concentration, the spin transition does increase its pressure. But at higher iron concentrations, we stop at 60%, they become magnetically ordered. And so it's no longer the classic or canonical high spin, low spin transition. And this begs a question about whether how complete the MGO FEO periclase wustite solid solution is at high pressures and temperatures because it's, it, it's interrupted by a magnetically ordered transition. But that at higher temperatures, this will broaden up. This is entropy driven. It's more favored to not be in 100% low spin state. And so it's some mixture of high spin and low spin. And then finally, just looking at the at the uh, Bridgmanite to post-Bridgmanite transition. This is uh, the last example in that uh, the influence of the Clapeyron slope, which is thought to be positive, actually extremely positive, ranging from 9 to about 12 in some studies, that we can see that if this is indeed happening inside the Earth and we know what pressure we, can, we know the pressure inside of the Earth very well. We don't know the temperature very well. But in a very simple assessment of this system, because of course it's more complicated, is that dialing in on, the core, on this D double prime area and the Clapeyron slope of this transition could provide at least a, a small constraint on the temperature there. So we have a, a, a thermometer where we didn't have this thermometer before. The, the deepest thermometer before this uh, transition was observed was the core mantle boundary, which was an extrapolation uh, from the inner core, outer core boundary along an adiabat, assuming a certain melting point of iron and its alloys. And so this led to the suggestion that along certain temperature profiles, one could back transform to Bridgmanite and have these post-perovskite lenses, which could influence the heat flow across the core. And we know that that is an important constraint, or it is important for us to understand that in light of, say, these variations in thermal conductivity of iron, presence of radiogenic elements. And finally, with the, uh, this is a nice study of the high pressure behavior of silica, 
and showing that the phase transition to cyphertite is actually just a little bit higher than that uh, the post-perovskite that's occurring in MORB. This is done by Gorsholsky, Shim, and colleagues, and that this can complicate the, uh, the interpretation of seismic observations. It's no longer the single reflection that could be the sole, the sole cause could be post-Bridgmanite. There are multiple transitions happening in this region. And finally, I just want to end with uh, this uh, figure showing different petrologic assemblages that we shouldn't, of course, limit our thinking to a uh, peridotitic system, the morb system, the sediment system, which can deliver very hydrous phases to, um, to great depths. And that each of these phases have their own personalities. And they could help explain, for example, the velocity and the seismic velocity anisotropy. But because they have their own personalities and they are, many of them are quite anisotropic, of course they have variations in thermal conductivity, not just between the phases, but within the phase, because they could be, for example, a, an, an orthorhombic that could be characterized by orthorhombic symmetry, like Bridgmanite and post-Bridgmanite, but depending on their interconnectivity, meaning are they sheet structures or are they an, an interconnected network, they could give rise to very um, strongly conductive layers if aligned, which is argued for post-Bridgmanite, post-Perovskite, uh, along that sheet layer. And so that's what I'd like to, to end with and be happy to take some more questions. Jennifer. We're open there. What, what happens to the, what are the various phases that are stable for morb compositions at 2,000 kilometers and deeper? All these question marks uh, are exciting. What, what's down there? <laughs> Well, there are so, so there are some studies that f fill in these question marks. In this review paper, it was um, that you know, they're, I think, you know, probably being a little bit candid there. So there, this uh, this whole phase assemblage down here was uh, was investigated in that Gasholsky study, and the interesting finding in that study was that the assemblage, which just contains denser forms of those phases, um, that that a transition to the denser post-perovskite, post-Bridgmanite uh, layer uh, is at shallower depths than in a peridotitic system. And yeah, perhaps Dan can comment on that. Because it's a 2015 <laughs> paper, right, that you took that figure from? This the review, no, the, the next slide? The question mark slide. Yeah. And yes. My personal view on that plot is pretty outdated, um, miserably for more. It's not just our group, but there are three or four more groups that actually went down to the core mineral boundary for more. And mineralogy is remarkably consistent throughout the experiment. So my short answer to your question is that uh, down to the core mineral boundary, that mineralogy stays the same, but some of them individually go through the phase transformation. Like stichobite. Yes, like stichobite, also post perovskite transi transition appears to occur shallower depth than bulk mantle. And, and that is a little different between the studies, but the basic picture of four different minerals with roughly similar content remains to be more or less true through four or five different experiments until yeah. the core mineral boundary. So I don't know how, why they put the um, question mark there, but to me, following the um, literature, there's no question mark over there. For the sediment, I would agree with the, um, the, the, the schematic view, but the problem is, there are many different possibilities for the composition of sediment that goes into the mantle. 
So we experimentalists doesn't know what, uh, don't know which system to study first. More of it is simpler because there is a better consensus about the bulk composition. Yeah. So for calcium silicate perovskite, it stays just stable. And aluminum phase, there, those are minor phases. So it's sometimes very difficult because it goes down below the resolution limit of technology that we use. Um, perovskite, our results shows that the post-perovskite transition happens about 100 kilometer or 200 kilometer shallower than what is expected for the then prototype. this transition. Yes. In this system. Right. And for stichobite, there's a, there's a well-known phase transformation. There's a slight difference between different studies, but there's a good consensus that stichobite undergoes transformation before comatal boundary. Yeah. Yeah, that could That's be. That's what we try to argue in the paper, but no one followed up, so. Hope seismologists can take advantage of that. Yeah. Um, well, this is a question for Jennifer, but maybe also for Dan. Uh, if uh, can there be post perovskite at the bottom of the LSVPs with these large Clapeyron slopes, or does it totally depend on the depth and composition? I, uh, I think and based on the thermal profiles of these LSVPs, that it seems unlikely that it would be at the base because the temperatures, I mean, they're from this, the, from the 3D study, just a, a recent study, the one that Ella McNamara showed, that yes, there are these pockets that are the highest temperatures, those are inboard from the LLSVPs, uh, but even under, because there's a, if, if there is a chemical anomaly, so if these are modeled as chemical anomalies, they will heat up. They will heat up more than, than the rest of the mantle. The, of course, it, it, would, it would be lovely to have a thermometer and just place it down there, and then we could say this, it's there, it's not there. Um, well, not a thermometer, we just get, go, go down there and look. Uh, but judging from the clapper on slope, it's unlikely. So does that mean that we could uh, still see it in the colder regions outside of the LLSVPs? Because there's another yes. component to it, which is an isotropy. Right. And w w there is some evidence that uh, we can see uh, at least more anisotropy in the cold regions, like the ring around the LLSVPs, than inside the LLSVPs. Right. And you haven't talked about anisotropy, but post perovskite, as I understand it, is stronger anisotropy than than bridgmanite. Yes, but uh, as we consider more uh, real, some you know more scenarios that would be consistent with with subduction, for example, MORB, there are other phases that you know, one should consider as being uh, sources of seismic anisotropy. And so this is something I think that really should be investigated more because, post, for example, post-Bridgmanite, that anisotropy is based on only calculations. So it could be less anisotropic. It could be more anisotropic. But uh, then you have to consider the proportions, right? Because seis seismology can only see averages, right? And so it's dominated right. by, by the more abundant uh, components, right? Unless they are extremely anisotropic. So I think one has to do that calculation to rule out certain phases for example, the silica component, which is which is extremely anisotropic, at least at low pressures. Uh, the you know the the behavior of these. I mean, one thing that one can put question marks here is not that necessarily the phases, but the anisotropic el the elastic anisotropy, the single crystal elastic tensors of these phases. Only a f only a few have been actually experimentally measured. Many have been calculated. Bridgmanite, post-Bridgmanite, um, I mean, all of the phases, actually, most of them have been computed from first principles. And so I think this is a tractable problem because the only way for us to, I mean, how does one induce that anisotropy? First, it has to, which I think will be covered in, um, in the rheology uh, talks or in, in terms of developing fabric. First, the system has to develop fabric. Uh, 
yeah, and then that system has to have anisotropic components that propagate the shear for example, ah the horizontally polarized shear wave faster than the vertically polarized shear wave. Rudy Let's thank Jennifer. It's coffee. Uh, Rudy will have the last question. Last comment. Now, isn't the post-station wide, uh, so SiO2 isn't a cubic? Correct. And so it would have a much lower anisotropy. Oh, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Thorombic. And, and is it anisotropic? Yeah, and cubic systems we know can be uh, strongly anisotropic, like MGO, for example. Yes, yes, thanks, Chris. Uh, for each of these categories, these three categories, what, what's the approximate mass fraction? Uh, instead of volume fraction, you mean? So no, no, I don't mean, I mean, if you were to take pyrolite, more and sediments and talk ah, about yes. the mass fraction in the mantle. Okay, so the sediments, so just back of the envelope calculation, it would have to, so it depends on, uh, you know, we should do this or perhaps somebody um, already has done this, is that based on subduction history, how much slab material, meaning let's say how much of this 8 to 10 kilometer, 8 to 12 kilometer thick mid-oceanic ridge basalt, is subducted into the earth over time compared to the sort of the crystallization. So this is thought to be the result of the crystallization of the earth, but this comp that is also argued about in terms of its exact chemistry and proportion. And the, the sediments are, you know, a very thin veneer, but yet they probably contribute a lot to a mechanisms for a flow, I think, because they, they definitely are more anisotropic in their bonding environments and also in their hydration content. So okay, maybe a question to follow up on here at Cider. I, I, I think the answer is that it's a lot, a little and very, very little in terms of volume. Yeah. But that doesn't correspond to significance, right. as you say, because right. the, the, particularly the volatiles could play a huge role. Right. I, I would come back to the question of, of uh, what is an LLSVPs. They are not mm -hmm. amorphous, massive structures, as far as yeah. we can tell. And we've seen internal structure that's compatible with one or more multiple phase changes. They haven't been explained. They're mm -hmm. probably difficult to reconcile with silicon, uh, the, the shallowest of them might be. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I'd say that there's not much confidence in saying that post perovskite doesn't exist in LLSVPs or that other things may or may not exist. But there is complexity seismologically. And I think it's fair to say it's not, there's no consensus, but there's structure. And understanding yeah. that structure may be key to understanding the internal dynamics of the LLSVP. Yes, yes. Couldn't agree more. So it's time for us to take a short coffee break, but 
Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to kick off the mineral physics portion of the CIDR program. So I wanted to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. And please feel free to interrupt as I go forward. And also, all of these slides will be available. Um, I'd like to acknowledge a PhD student that's working with me, Natalia Solomatova, who uh, was heavily engaged in uh, the creation of this presentation. And uh, right now, she's at Goldschmidt. So she is presenting her work with uh, myself and Paul Asimov there. And uh, you'll see Goldschmidt come up a little bit later here in the talk. Uh, so what I'm really excited about is the, uh, well, many things, but the individuality of all of these phases and minerals, basically, that make up our planet. So each phase inside of the Earth has its own personality. And this is dictated by essentially the, the atoms and the arrangements that make up the phase, and also dictated by thermodynamics. Right? So in terms of an equilibrium assemblage, you know, one goes towards uh, the lowest energy. Um, and what I show here are just a few snapshots of some of the major players, either in dynamics or in sort of interpretation of Earth's history. That includes a mineral inclusion that has a significant hydration component to it in diamond. Uh, Bridgmanite, which is a major silicate in Earth's uh, lower mantle, that only just received its name last year when it was found in a meteorite uh, and described by Oliver Chowner and his colleagues. And San Carlos Olivine, which is a lower pressure assemblage, uh, what we think makes up or at least describes a primitive upper mantle of the Earth that, contain, that contains uh, olivine and depending on the pressure can include uh, garnet and pyroxenes. And uh, what I also show here is the cleft segment of the Juan de Fuca Ridge, which is an active spreading area, and so which demonstrates that uh, at least one example that the Earth is extremely dynamic, active, and melting, and that these processes could be occurring throughout the entire Earth's interior, and that those processes are dictated by the individual components and their assemblages uh, that are uh, stable at uh, deeper depths. So a brief outline of the talk is, uh, the tutorial is really um, just, to do a, just to do a basic overview of compositional constraints. Uh, these will be covered uh, in more depth in the geochemistry tutorials. And building minerals and coordination environments, essentially what are the common coordination environments, Again, these are the building blocks of the planet. And individually, they have their own distinct properties that can then essentially dictate the entire uh, behavior of the planet, which includes flow. And substitution mechanisms, so these are, oh, okay, I can use that, or the bamboo stick. And so some substitution mechanisms, which is uh, you know, a common uh, phenomena in uh, lower pressure mineral phases, and two component phase diagrams, including partial melting. So essentially, this is to get everyone uh, on the same page and even keel of major mineral phases, their coordination environments, and their uh, phase diagrams. Okay, so a basic uh, compositional constraints do come from uh, observations of our sun. So in terms of the terrestrial planets, uh, we have some constraints because we can observe the compositional spectrum of the sun. Now the details, so again, I'm not going to go into all of the details of the individual elements and what constrains each proportion because those are still a subject of great discussion in the community. And we saw earlier uh, in Matt Jackson's talk uh, about the uh, Cola Superdeep, so essentially the deepest 
drill hole is only about 12.262 kilometers. Actually, they, they've, there's a uh, slightly deeper hole, but this is you know, more horizontal, so it's a little bit <laughs> cheating. So this is a, one of the deepest vertical depths, and you know, compared to 6,000 and change kilometers of the radius of the Earth, this is really just a pinprick. And so how do we then gain a foundation and essentially uh, you know, an understanding of what could possibly be uh, stable at deeper parts of the planet, which again, control the dynamics, can control the dynamics, their behaviors. And so going uh, deeper, one can look at Mantle Xenolis, San Carlos Olivine, for example. These are snapshots of primitive parts of the mantle uh, before they've been partially melted. So we'll get into that in, in a little bit. And some uh, primitive meteorites as well as palisites, which have been differentiated, the core mantle boundaries of smaller planetary bodies. And going deeper in terms of, uh, in terms of remote techniques, of course, seismology probes the mantle at very high spatial resolutions. Of course, depending on the region of the, of the interior of the planet, it can be extremely high spatial resolutions. And uh, experimental methods, such as large volume apparatus, a piston cylinder, or multi-anvil press. Then going smaller into um, the diamond anvil cell regime, which can access multi-megabar pressures, thus trying to tap into phase equilibria. And it's a competition between the attractive, the binding forces, and the repulsive forces. And so these are dictated by the, essentially the, the forces between the atoms, the charges. And we'll go through some of those uh, examples in just a minute. And this can be determined experimentally, typically using X-ray diffraction, or neutron diffraction. It's mostly for the bulk material. Surface type probes include transmission electron microscopy, atomic force microscopy, electronic backscattering diffraction. But there really is no perfect crystal that exists. I think the closest thing come the closest thing is silicon. So you may have seen that, well, sometimes one can see these huge chunks of silicon that can make them essentially boulder sized quantities with less than far less than a percent of vacancies. And that's essentially why they can be used as optical devices, They're essentially used to monochromate uh, x-rays, just for example. But there's no per really no perfect crystal exists. And this, this is also a, an exciting area because there's, I mean, at any point in time, the, 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 the structure of the, the material is just a snapshot of those atomic positions. Really, these atoms have a certain you know, neighborhood that they occupy. They, you know, so they have vibrational properties. Those define part of the stability, the vibrational thermodynamics. And many of these phases, especially at low pressure in the crustal areas, have defects. They're simply crystal they simply crystallize out. And in that particular environment, they have um, they have voids in their crystal structure. And how those defects change with uh, compression is also a, you know, a uh, focus of, sort of interdisciplinary research because it guides essentially how materials can flow. And we'll also see more details about, uh, we'll have more discussion about rheology uh, next week. and. Um, and later this week, there'll be uh, more focused talks on elasticity and equations of state. And so in this presentation, I'm going to go through some of these common bonding environments. Uh, these are, uh, you know, in terms of crustal materials, we have the linear arrangement, triangular arrangement, tetrahedral, octahedral, cubic. Some examples. Of course, is a common uh, carbonate phase, the calcite, which is uh, characterized by this triangular arrangement. And then you can imagine that uh, as we go into uh, lar larger coordinations, 
that we also have a very different uh, environment. So in the courts system, it's essentially described as an interconnected network. And why this is a is this is stable or not stable, uh, that is touched upon in um, some of the uh, rules that we'll d that we'll go into. Pauline's rules, for example. And in uh, in Pericles or in uh, olivine or pyroxene, the magnesium the common coordination number of magnesium is an octahedral environment. Now, as soon as a transition metal goes into that octahedral environment, it will distort it, and it will distort it in, it's described as the Jan-Teller distortion. Now, that distortion, we'll see, has a large effect on physical properties of materials, and that's expressed in spin crossovers, where the iron atoms will change from a high spin state to a low spin state. Now that's, we'll give an example of that a little bit later, but in, yes. Just inboard and outboard. Uh, in, as a three-dimensional oh. object. In and yeah, in and out. <laughs> right, yeah, in and out. So we have something like this in three dimensions. And as soon as a transition metal ion comes in there, a cation comes in there, the unfilled D electrons favor a elongated section of this octahedron, which makes a Jan Teller distortion that essentially deviates from a cubic symmetry. And so it's essentially not perfect cubic symmetry, which can lead to some very um, interesting behaviors as that coordinate, as that symmetry changes. And that's what we'll see in a few minutes. So in these systems, uh, we have a common classification for uh, tetrahedral coordinations. And in isolated tetrahedrons, common in olivine and garnets, now, they, if they tend to sh uh, share corners, they can go into double tetrahedra chains or double chains. And an, essentially an infinite network and a sheet structure. So what we'll see is sort of an interesting uh, arrangement of these tetrahedra as we, as we compress the common phases. For example, in olivine, we start out with an isolated tetrahedral network. And at higher compressions, that those tetrahedra tend to, um, well, what we'll see is that they'll go into share corners and an infinite network in the Bridgmanite structure. And so having these uh, specific arrangements of atoms can see already that it will lead to, it could lead to anisotropic behavior. And so the forces that are acting on these um, atoms, which are expressed as bonds, you can imagine in a chain structure that uh, these, this could result in, say, higher forces along uh, deep in the mantle, the base of the mantle, and the core, at least in terms of the Earth. And, and uh, the theory and experiments that complement and also guide some of the experiments that are done. So in terms of uh, element distributions, I've simply just uh, highlighted some of the major uh, elements and fractionated it to the weight um, in the crust and the weight um, sort of whole earth approximation. Of course, these are approximations because, again, as we've uh, we're discussing this morning. It's not, you know, it's not completely settled whether the Earth is chondritic, for example, and so that can dictate the relative abundances of things like uh, the magnesium content, the magnesium silicon ratio, for example, which, depending on that ratio, that could essentially make it could produce a more viscous lower mantle, just for example. Uh, and so that will, uh, so in terms of understanding that part, 
i the details of the individual elements that will also you know again be discussed more in more detail in the geochemistry talks i put a few of the oxidation states of iron that are commonly observed there is a recent suggestion that it could exist as four plus that is controversial of course that is something of you know, current interest and in how the oxidation state of iron varies with depth and, uh, and hydration, the presence of hydration. And of course, where these elements reside then dictates the behavior of the materials. And so I'll go into some examples there. Just for example, yeah. What's an example oh. of a mineral that would have iron more than three plus? There's a suggestion that uh, iron hydroxide, uh, when subducted down to core mantle boundary conditions, can disassociate and essentially free up the hydrogen atoms, leaving FeO2 as one of the products, which would and right, yes. Mm -hmm. So in the in the crust we have a, a very common, well, commonly thought assemblage of minerals, mostly dominated by the feldspars, the more than 50% of the crust, and including you know the nesosilicates, which are garnets and um, and olivine structures, and pyroxenes, quartz, micas, amphiboles. And uh, we'll go through a few of these uh, examples just to show what those minerals in terms of their internal structure look like. And I want to emphasize that the, you know, the, it's in terms of crystalline, in terms of the solid materials, uh, the crystalline materials, of course, have a lower free energy than their amorphous or, let's say, glassy counterparts. 